All right, a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, once again from uh, Captain Naps here. How are y'all doing? I hope you're doing well. I hope everybody's staying healthy and happy at home. Uh, welcome back to the stream. We've got uh, one more t one more turn to do here uh, in our pilot's live stream. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get around to it. Today's leg for uh, a pilot's life is a pretty quick and easy one. It's going to be from Calgary out here to... Saskatoon. Pretty straightforward uh, little flight, uh, just a little over an hour in the air, I believe. Uh, pull up my Sim uh, Simbit World Pilot's Life here. You'll see it's about uh, 279 miles, so it's basically about an hour flight in the Dash 8. So it's going to be a fairly quick little flight, and then we get to turn around and come right back. We're not going to do it today, but probably maybe later this week or uh, next week we'll get it done, and that will be the end of Season 2 of A Pilot's Life, and then we'll move on to something else. Uh, for now, I'm still kind of keeping my eye open on the job market here because I am really looking forward to a new job in the not-too-distant future here uh, on a pilot's life. Uh, I don't see anything that terribly interests me out of the aircraft, out of the uh, airlines that are here. Jazz, another Dash 8 operator, RJs as well, but I don't have an RJ for my sim, so probably not going to consider that one. Not really looking for uh, to fly around Japan. Um, cargo jet, uh, it's Canadian-based, which is great uh, for my airport scenery. However, uh, the one problem I have with cargo jet is uh, it's mostly uh, six sevens and five sevens now, which are again are airplanes I don't have in my sim. So uh, I kind of thought about next jet, but not really interested in flying around Europe yet. Same with Meridiana. Uh, I might consider that because they used to be a, an MD-80 operator. The Mad Dog was a fun jet to fly as well. So I thought about that one uh, briefly, but I think I'm going to try and stick it stick with it. I still have a couple more. Uh, I still have two more legs to go, so probably it'll be next week anyways before I'm uh, looking for a new job for sure. So these jobs all expire at the end of this week on the uh, 13th of April, so I won't, uh, I probably won't be taking any of them, but I will uh, start looking for a new job next week uh, just to get on a different aircraft type. I like the Dash 8. The Dash 8's a fantastic airplane, but kind of interested in just doing something a little different. I'm sure you guys want to see something different. You've seen me fly this now around for, uh, well, how many hours? Let's check the reports page, shall we? Hours... Uh, pilot career generate report and that'll show you how many hours I've got in total um, actually doesn't show you how many hours I got in total but it shows you uh, how many I've done here so we've done uh, probably about 25 or 30 hours by the looks of it in the dash 8 here just by ballparking this figure here uh, I think I do have a logbook I can look at uh, I can hit print logbook anyways I have 30 hours in uh, a pilot's life, which basically uh, it's all on the, on the Dash 8 so far. So it's it's been fun, and I do like the Dash 8. She's a great airplane. She's lots of fun to look at. It's a, it's a good airplane to fly, great modeling and everything else, but I am just not... Uh, uh, I'm just interested in doing something else. A little bit of variety changed up a little bit, so I want my next career to be, uh, my next uh, job to be on an aircraft other than the Dash 8. Uh, I would love to do the 37 just because I've, I've, I got the NGXU. It's a fun airplane. I've been flying it a lot lately. I've been getting kind of used to it, and I would love to just uh, bomb around, have some purpose behind it, and uh, go out on some of these legs with uh, with some purpose. So, um, but uh, yeah, so that's where we that's where we sit right now. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, worry about that hopefully next week. Um, but in the meantime, let's uh, go ahead and hop in the flight deck in just one second. Just going to change one thing here on my flight plan. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we're going to hop in the flight deck. We're going to get this flight underway. It shouldn't take us too long today to get this underway, and uh, then we'll turn around and come back and do it, do the uh, return leg another day. So uh, we're here parked at uh, gate 18 in Calgary, right where we left the airplane last time when we were in it. And there we go. Okay, I just need to make sure I throw a switch to make sure that the uh, the sound is up there. It sounds really quite quiet to me, so I may will uh, move the airplane up, and I may adjust the levels. I had to play with the levels uh, in my streaming software for Cross the Pond uh, on the weekend, so some of the stuff is a little bit uh, out of whack, and I had to reset some of the levels. So I'm just tweaking them ever so slightly to make sure that they're all uh, they're all good again here. All right, uh, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, let's go ahead and hop in the flight deck here, and let's get this uh, party started with. Uh, let's see here. The flight deck power-up checklist. All right, so track IR is enabled, and aircraft flight log will say we did check it. Circuit breakers checked and checked, and a landing gear is down. Radar off. Battery master main aux standby. 
on, main bus tie is on, uh, engine intake bypass doors, we're going to go ahead and click those buttons open, they won't move until we actually get some uh, external or APU power. Uh, position lights, always make sure they're on so everyone knows the airplane is powered, nobody kills the ground power with the airplane powered. Flight deck display is on, they're all coming to life here. We can turn on the arc dues, we cannot turn on the FMS until we get power established. Uh, standby PTU pumps are off, and emergency brake is park. External power APU should be working. And there we go, and it does say external power on, perfect, looks like everything came to life. We got lights here on the doors, and we should now be able to energize our FMSs. There they go. Uh, main and landing gear. Doors pull and release. Done. And safety equipment and door documents will say it's checked. FMS is initialized. They are initializing right now, Thank so we're getting there. All right, and we're going to get ready to start the pre-flight events here. Hey, Captain, how are you today? I am good. Sound like I sound like a real tool when I talk to him like that. Normally, you'd start with like an anecdote or something. Oh, my kids, my wife, uh, this, that, the next thing. Or as it is co as it is uh, customary these days, you just talk about COVID for about thirty-five minutes and then go flying. But uh, we're not going to do that. We're just going to tell him we're good and <laughs> leave it at that. And he can just wonder about whether or not we're actually telling the truth and what's actually going on in our private life. Okay, uh, so there we go. So we got the, the power-up checklist is complete and. Uh, one thing I did not do was I did not actually set up my tablet cam properly here. Give me one second. There we go. Okay, we're just going to check this. It might need to be realigned. Oh boy, does this camera ever need to be aligned. Unfortunately, it's mounted on a shelf, and I tend to knock it with things when I'm not doing things here. So I tend to knock it without realizing that I've knocked it. And I should have configured this before I got in the flight deck. I really should have. And that's my... That's my bad. Hold on, let's do that. How about that? Okay, right about there. Alright, I think that looks pretty good for you guys. So, uh, as always, we're using the AviWorks Remote CDU. I know you can't see that well. It's a really lousy old webcam. I pulled it out just for the sake of showing this off. Showing what I'm doing on it. It's not a great webcam. I wouldn't recommend that it. It's old, but... Around. Thank you. But it gets the job done. It shows you how useful this can be as a tool, and it really is a useful tool. Okay, uh, so he's going to go do the walk around. While he's doing the walk around, I'm just going to set up a few things. First of all, I'm going to set the departure brief today because I have neglected to do this in the past, and uh, it's really kind of uh, bitten me a few times. So I'm going to make sure I go through this. So we are doing a gate departure. Uh, there is SDX in Calgary. We're going to depart in heading mode. Level 1 anti-ice for departure, flaps 5 today, departure type is a SID, uh, end top, yeah, uh, it, we're going to get vectors anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, departure, uh, takeoff power, let's do a reduced takeoff power today, let's do reduced ADV 83, which is pretty common on long runways, uh, bleeds on, and concerns not very good. Okay, so we can go ahead and close that up. So that just sort of configures the FO for your departure. Um, so you know, so he knows what's going on and he sets every, everything. The biggest thing is the flaps on there. Uh, if you want a non... Oop, didn't mean to hit that button again. Nope, didn't mean to hit that button. Ah, <laughs> hit the wrong buttons here. I want to hit the brief button again here. Okay, so hitting the brief button here again. Yeah, so the biggest thing is the flap 5. If you, uh, Making sure that you do have flap 5 here. And also heading nav mode for departure. This sets up whether or not you do a transponder uh, on, on depart, uh, for the taxi or not. Really, it should be most places nowadays should be yes. It should kind of default to yes. And takeoff power, he'll set the takeoff power. So uh, it's just a few of those things are kind of important for how the FO is going to configure the aircraft for you as you go. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and start with our flight deck flows. While the FO's out doing his walk around, we're going to go through the flight deck and make sure everything is configured properly for departure. Batteries are all on. Electricals basically are all on. We just don't have to reset any bus faults at this time. Uh, ice protection is all off. Just the engine intake bypass doors are open. And uh, exterior lights we don't need. Uh, the APU is not running, but all the valves are open for the engine. The levers are in. Uh, no other warning caution lights. Yellow lights illuminated here. 
Uh, it's a nice daytime flight, we won't need night lighting. We're not going to use the APU for departure, we'll use the GPU, it saves a lot of gas. Uh, it's not something most operators commonly do unless they're really required to because it just saves so much uh, gas. Just start one engine at the gate and use that GPU. That GPU is used a fraction of the power in the, in the grand scheme of things, just to use electricity straight out of the wall. It's a lot of power, mind you, I mean it's a fairly high amperage, but still, compared to how much uh, fuel an APU burns on an hourly basis versus how much it costs to, to put, you know, 20 or 30 amps through this GPU on an hourly basis. APUs are ridiculously expensive, so we don't use them if we don't have to. Obviously, if you need them for start, uh, like most jets do for an air start, of course you're going to use them. Engine start panel, everything is in the correct position. Norms, and the no engine is started right now. Uh, pressurization panel, we're not going to worry about setting the landing altitude right now. We'll set it in flight, but we do have the auto mode set. The valves are closed, man diff switch is in the neutral position. The position lights are the only lights that are on. Emergency lights should be armed as soon as you get ready to start boarding passengers. Uh, no smoking should be on at all times, uh, pretty much everywhere in the world nowadays. We don't pretty much, uh, nobody smokes on airplanes anymore. Anywhere. Shouldn't be anyways. I think there are still some people in some countries that do it, but it's, especially in North America, it's been a given for the last, like, 25 to 30 years that nobody smokes in an airplane. So, it's kind of funny that the switch is still there, but it's just a throwback to how old the original Dash 8 design is, where it was something where you could smoke from time to time in an aircraft. Not something, again, that we expect anybody to be doing anymore. Research fan should be on. And that's about it. The bleeds are in, uh, the packs are in auto, the bleeds are off, the AC gens are on, and that's about it. Alright, and uh, hold on one second, I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Uh, back with you here, and uh, so where were we? We were at the AC panel, that was all good, so we're going to go ahead and roll down here and start looking at setting up for departure from Calgary. First thing we need to do before we can do that is just check out what is the weather doing in Calgary. Alright, checking the METAR on the VATSIM network here. Winds are out of the north, so we're going to have to taxi for a northbound departure. And, uh, uh, let's see here, 3027 on the meter was the other thing I was looking for. So let's go ahead and set 3027. Alright, uh, we got that set. Field elevation here in Calgary. And we're going to pull out our Navigraph charts to tell us that. Uh, it's 30, I want to say it's 34 and change. I'm getting fast, I'm getting better at this. I'm learning uh, this airport quite well. You'd think so by the time I have gotten through as much flying as I have here. Uh, let's see here, Calgary, field elevation 3606. So we really need 3700 feet for our flap retraction. So we can go ahead and set that up here. So we always set our MDA to our flap retraction acceleration altitude. So we have a really good visual reference as we go by. We don't want to be, it's a long, we don't want to have to think too hard. We don't want to have to remember things during takeoff, especially if something goes wrong and your brain is suddenly overwhelmed by an emergency. You don't want to be thinking about, oh, wait a minute, what's the acceleration altitude? So what we do is we mark it on our altimeter using the MDA uh, line here. Super easy, simple trick, but it makes it so much easier. You don't have to think about the acceleration altitude. You just see it scroll right by on your altimeter. So. 1,000 feet above the ground here, 3606 rounds up to 37, which we then add 1,000 feet, it's 4,700 feet. Uh, let's see here, we're going to do the departure from Calgary. I assume we're going to do the Calgary 7 at this point. So, I um, believe it's 7,000. Yep, 7,000 is the top altitude. Great. So set that over there. 7,000. And... Uh, let's see here, what else do we need? So we need uh, a heading as well. I uh, can go to the chart. For the 35, for the 35, it's 345 is the heading. Perfect, 345. That's set, and then of course we need speeds, and to, no to do speeds, we of course need, uh, uh, we need our weight and balance. So let's go ahead, and I'm just going to pause my track IR for a second here, just so it stops moving so much. All right, where is my sim brief flight plan here today? All right, so here's my sim brief flight plan. Actually, that's not my sim brief flight plan. Sorry, that's just the sim brief page. Let me pull up the flight plan itself because it's so much easier to kind of look at the the PDF version here. Uh, I can put it in there, I guess, if I, if I want. All right, so uh, first things first, weight and balance-wise, we are probably looking at pretty close to full bust because for some reason SimBrief always uh, plans us to within a very small margin of a full bus here. So 71 people here. So okay, I'm back from the walk around. Everything looks good. 
Thank you. Alright, uh, so 71, so we just need to delete one person from our existing oop, load here, and that's good. Uh, and then, of course, we can also come to our simple flight plan and look up our fuel load, which is the other half of the equation here. So, uh, the fuel we're going to need to get to, uh, let's see here, to get to Saskatoon with Regina as an alternate today is, uh, thir so we're going to need about 6,200 pounds loaded. I didn't look at the weather, so let me just have a quick look at the Regina weather and make sure that as an alternate it is valid. It's got some snow showers going on, 15 miles. Pardon me, sorry. Um, it's a little bit lower visibility in a few places. So let's scroll down really quick here to the uh, Matt Tyson Tafts, which should be here in our flight plan somewhere. Uh, Regina, let's just make sure that the forecast for Regina is reasonable for an alternate. Two miles in light snow showers as a tempo. It's not great. Um, not terrible, not great. So we'll bring a bunch of extra fuel. So this flight plan, uh, I didn't, I neglected to calculate extra fuel in this flight plan. So it gave me 6,200 pounds just as the base fuel with no extra at all, uh, zero extra. So let's let's add 2,000 pounds of extra. That's about an hour's worth of fuel in a dash eight extra. So 62, uh, 72, 82. So let's call it 8,200 pounds just to give us lots of, uh, of of wiggle room in case the weather does deteriorate at our alternate as well as our destination. Uh, so 6,200 plus it's 8,200 pounds, and the trip fuel, we're only going to need to burn about 2,500 of it to get to uh, Saskatoon. So there we go, we've got our takeoff weight today, it's going to be 63,000. As always, we're pretty close to full, so we're always taking some pretty heavy loads here. I might change to a flap 15 departure. Excuse me, I might change to a flap 15 departure just because this is a high altitude airport and I'd like to do an intersection departure today just to save some of that taxiing time. So I think what we'll do is we'll change that up. We'll do flap 15. So we change that in the briefing. And uh, so let's go ahead and set that up for a flap 15, 63,000 pound departure. We're looking at speeds of still, still pretty fast speeds and especially at this high altitude it'll take us a little bit of time to reach that speed. So I don't want to run out of runway here. So we'll do 21, 21, 21. Wouldn't want to run out of runway. And I found that the one time that I did do an intersection departure on 35 left, I did go through the runway pretty quickly. I uh, I, I didn't run out of runway, but it, I, I, I got pretty close to using up the runway that was there from the uh, display threshold, or from my uh, intersection departure. So because we're going to plan another intersection departure, let's go ahead and pump this up here. Okay, so now we got uh, our PFD is almost all set up. The only thing we need now is uh, go around button, and then we hit heading and alt cell. Although I don't know why I hit has heading because then this guy always undoes the heading mode on me. Let's just get to make sure these levers are in a good position here, and those should work there, and the flap lever works as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we got all this up. We don't have we have a flag there because we haven't set anything yet. Okay, uh, moving right along. 3027 on the meter, set that in the back up as well. That's good. Uh, landing gears down, flaps will set 15 for the immediate return if we have to come back. Uh, FMS will set up in a minute. Uh, the screens are looking good. Our disconnects are all in. None of the pumps are on. The alternate feathers are not on. We can test the CVR. It doesn't really work in this uh, model, but Go the takeoff trims within the limits. It's always stuck at the forward limit, and I always like to move it back a little bit, but that always triggers a warning, which it shouldn't. You should be able to reset the trim in the airplane without triggering a warning when the power is off. Uh, the other trims are all neutral. Weather radar is not on, and let's go ahead and set up for now Unicom 122.8. Make sure we're ready to go. And there's no, Cal there's no Edmonton Center online today. There is a Winnipeg Center online if they're still there when we get there. Then we will uh, then we will uh, we'll tune them in when the time comes. All right, so we got 2,000 on the transponder, and that's it. So we're now set up, except for getting the FMS up and running. All right, so let's get that FMS up and running. And uh, stand by one second again while I just check on one more thing.
All right, I feel like I missed the call. Yes. Did they start boarding without me? I think they started boarding without me. That's okay. Okay. Uh, they started boarding without me, that's okay. Alright, so we're gonna go ahead and set up this FMS over here. And we'll go ahead and pull it out. And just pop it in the corner here so you guys can follow along as we're doing it. Um, where's my flight plan here? Alright, there's my Simbri flight plan. Here's my routing down here. So we're gonna go ahead and set that up. Flight plan page. We are going from Calgary to Saskatoon. Alright, so we're gonna do menu, depart. Uh, we're gonna plan to depart 35 left. On the Calgary 7 for now, for lack of any better guidance, off 35 left. And then we're going to go to a fix called VetB. Uh, so we put it in here above the destination and we just keep going from there. Vet B. Uh, then we do Q967, so we have to do list uh, airway. Q967 is number one until we get to Imota, number right. four. Thank you. And then we go direct to Mavob and join the Mavob six arrivals. So M A V O B, Mavob. And then menu. Arrive. Uh, Sim brief estimates we're going to use runway 27. We'll go with that for now and we'll see what we get from uh, as, as we get a little closer in there. Uh, so runway 27 transition and we're going to do. Uh, I don't see an ILS, but I will try an RNAV Zulu. I'll buy that. Uh, I really have no idea what fix to use here. Let's just see here really quickly. Don't worry about that. Saskatoon, show me the procedures. Uh, so if we do the Mavob 6 arrival for runway 27, that looks like it takes us out to Pibnu. So Pibnu is the transition we want to have on here. And then back on the flight plan page, and we're good. Hello. Alright, so that's all in there, down to runway 27 there, and including a missed approach, that's all there, good. Uh, fuel, again, same brief. Give me what I need here. Hello. Sim brief flight plan here. Uh, so we've got uh, alternate fuel of 1334. 45 minute holding fuel of uh, 1332. Uh, no zero, zero extra fuel planned. And fuel on board, we should be at 8200. And uh, so fuel on board is planet 8200 and our ZFW today is planet 55462. 55462. There we go. And that's it. And then we just need a time zone for Saskatoon. Uh, I honestly don't know. You know what? I'm going to honestly have to Google it. It's probably... Uh, I don't even know. I think it's minus... I want to say it's minus five. It might be minus six. Uh, it's at GMT minus six, so we'll go with minus six there. Uh, you might have that on a flight plan if you actually had a flight plan, but that's interesting. I don't even know. Okay. Uh, anyways, carrying on. Uh, we got the FMS all set up. I think we're pretty much ready to go. We're ready to start doing some checklists. We should probably do the 24-hour system checks today because we booted this airplane up from cold. So now we're going to go ahead and throw off a few things here. 285, 284, 14360, 2923, and there's the tone. And test the number 2 system over here. 285, 284, 14360, 2923, and there's the tone. And install warning test 1. A go stall warning fail one and push the system fail and then oop, push it the other way and you get stall system two fail and the pusher fail. All right, those are tested. No, nope, don't test it again. Uh, we push the auto feather button. It does the test. Yeah, it's doing the test. 
we should uh, just turn on power to the APU system so the valve opens, and then we do the test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Ten different things you need there. The APU, the engine is actually simpler, we can turn this off now. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sorry. Yep. I'm going to have to recalibrate my track iron a second here. And the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You really should let it stop in between. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so the test. Bag of smoke warning. And the other one. Perfect. Alright, 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 alright. Stop being all jumpy on me here, honestly. I can get this together. All right, and aft is just five. One day you'll learn the lights. If I ever get around to doing fire protection for my systems course, uh, you'll learn the lights then. All right, and have we got everything? I think we got everything, guys. All right, so let's go ahead, and we're just waiting for that. Yeah, auto feather test passed. All right, where's my checklist? 24 hour system. Oh, it helps if I meet this guy. 24 hour systems check Engine checklist. Fire detection. Test. APU fire detection. Test. Baggage smoke warning aft and forward. Test. Stall warning test 1 and 2. Uh, test. ADC 1 and 2. Test. Auto feather. Test. Chipless TCAS. Test. PA system. Test. Hi guys, here's a load sheet for you. Have a safe flight. Trims. Test. 24 hour system checks complete. Thank you. Alright, we got the load sheet. We're fully boarded here. And just about ready to get started with departure. Before start checklist. Before start checklist. Stand by. Let's get ready for. Still boarded passengers according to GSX. One thing I killed all my yeah. Bridge and agent checks flow. Uh, complete. 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 Gear pins stowed. Pre-flight checks. Complete. Complete. External power APU voltage. On checked twenty-seven volts. Circuit breakers. Checked. Checked. Escape hatch. Closed. Nose wheel steering. Off. Flight guidance control panel set. Fuel quantity one one seven two zero pounds on board. That's not what I did. Did I send it? There. Checked. Eight thousand pounds required. Hydraulic number three pressure. On. Er, check zero psi. Emergency brake pressure. Park. Check. Power levers. Disc. Condition levers. Fuel off. Emergency light switch. Arm. Fasten belt switch. On. On. Departure briefing. Complete. Um, are you sure? Before we start, check this complete. Alright, I knew the answer was not complete, but, uh... Uh, just for the sake of continuing the checklist. Okay, so let's do a proper departure briefing now while we're waiting here for my uh, GSX to finish loading baggage and everything else. So today we're going to be doing... Oh, there we go. Boarding is now complete. Uh, we're going to be doing a departure from Calgary off runway 35 left. So first of all, for any master... Uh, for any engine failure, master warning, or direction control issue prior to B1, uh, we'll call aboard stop the aircraft on the runway. If... Uh, if we're at or above V1, we'll continue to take off at 400 feet, uh, or sorry, with no immediate actions prior to uh, 4,700 feet, except for raising the gear at 4,700 feet, we'll accelerate to V5, track oh, yeah. the flaps, continue with V climb to uh, 7,000 feet when established in the climb, we'll act as the emergency. The departure today is uh, going to be off runway 35 left. We're going to do it from intersection uniform about halfway down this runway. This will leave us 7,000 feet. That's plenty for dash 8, especially flat 15 departure. So we're going to taxi uh, Kilo and Charlie down to uh, uniform, depart from uniform. Locking gear. 
Uh, the departure, the Calgary 7 departure off of runway uh, 35 left. 10 3 Alpha, 26 of March 2020. Safe altitude 100 miles is 13,800 non jet aircraft. Refer to noise paper procedure for additional requirements. And uh, climb to maintain 7,000 feet for vectors to the assigned route or depicted fix. And 35 left specifically climb heading 345 as assigned. So we cut 345 on the heading. We got 7,000 feet on the altitude. Uh, we're going to push back tail left. And uh, that's about all I've got. Uh, I never did look and see what's on those noise abatement charts. So let's see what's on the noise abatement charts. Usually there are minimum turn altitudes. Uh, departures, uh, preferential runways, departure procedures, SID cancellation. All runways climb to 6,500 feet MSL on ATC design SID heading before proceeding on course. Pilots with responsibility to adhere to published noise abatement procedures. So 6,500 is the minimum altitude for turns. So we'll make sure we climb to 6,500 for noise bait before we do any turns. Okay. Uh, other than that, uh, terrain is uh, obviously an issue to the west of the field. As we head east of the field, it's not much of an issue. Um, and the prairies drop away pretty flat off to the east, which is the direction we're going. Weather is not an issue here. The destination, it's not terrible, but uh, there is uh, expected to be some snow on and off. So uh, we'll see what we see when we get there. Uh, yeah, temp tempo all afternoon of uh, four miles less snow shower. So it might be some snow when we get there. It might be interesting. Otherwise, uh, that's all I've really got. Uh, do you have any questions? No point asking this virtual FO because uh, I already missed my chance to brief him before the tape, but this was our checklist. So I'd say we're pretty much ready to go here. We got three minutes. I got it just done in the nick of time. So let's get uh, let's get out of here. Let's go ahead and close that cargo door there. I don't know why it's still open, guys. When you're done loading bags, just, just close it. You don't have to wait. Just close it. And we do have to uh, close exit one. So uh, let's just make sure we are good to go here. All right, guys. Everyone's seated. We're all buttoned up and ready to go in the back. Thank you. If you need anything, just let me know. All right, let's go ahead and remove the jetway. Close the door. That should give me my last green in a second here. Oh, let me guess. It closed the door automatically when I moved the jetway and I reopened it. <laughs> That's why I got the warning again. Alright, one quick last check here just to see what's going on on Fat Spy and uh, it looks like we lost one to Fake Center, so. Oh well, what can you do? Looks like it's going to be a ATC free afternoon again. Nothing much you can do. This is the time I get to stream. I get what I get. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. So let's go ahead and do engine start checklist to the line. Battery master remain auxiliary standby. On. Doors fueling lights. Closed and out. Any collision light. Red. Engine start checklist complete to the line. Below the line. AP bleed. Off. Engine. Clear on two. Clear on two. Engine start checklist complete. Start two for me, please. Starting two. Departure check completed. Bypass pin inserted. Release parking brakes. Stand by. Okay, that's associated with the engine start. Make sure generators hold and load. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. Please disconnect the GPU. Roger, disconnecting the GPU. Parking brakes. Captain, the GPU is now disconnected. All right. Commence up. Push. Due to icing conditions, please stand by for engine start until push completed and brakes set. And we're underway for another leg of the tour, ladies and gentlemen. 
All right, we're clear the bridge. Clear on two. Start two for me, please. Starting two. That's the wrong one. Start one for me, please. Starting one. Hopefully a real FO wouldn't know what I meant. I'm getting very used to flying a jet again, so I'm getting very used to starting the engines in a 1-2 sequence instead of a 2-1 like you do in the dash normally. So that's kind of throwing me for a bit of a loop again here. But nevertheless, here we go. Looks like a nice day out here in Calgary. Grass is green, growing. Summer is here, almost. What's the real temperature? It's really zero degrees in Calgary today, but it doesn't look too bad out there. Grass is starting to turn green in places anyways. Set parking brakes. Waiting your confirmation for good engine start. Alright, looks like we got two stable starts. You guys go ahead and disconnect and have a good day. That's associated with the engine start. Alright, away we go. While he's walking over, let's have a quick little check of a pilot's life and make sure oh, I did not I did not have the current flight screen up. This is why you check. Now we can hit start flight. There we go. And now it has end flight here, so it is monitoring our flight. Wouldn't want to forget to actually monitor the flight. That would be a bit Unlocking gear. That would be foolish. Kill that FMS for now, because it's not really doing much with it right now, so you guys don't have to see it. Alright, everybody's clear. He's going to give us a wave. Left is clear. Right is clear. Thank you. Condition levers to max. Alright, bye bye. We'll see you when we return to Calgary in another couple of days on the next stream. Alright, you can hear those props spiraling up now. We got them up. After start checklist. Stand by. Deactivated, then we deactivate the number two PCU. We should again get full rudder travel. Um, are you sure? Alright, mute you for a second while I explain what I'm doing. And then with both PCUs active again, we should Control still get power, APU. full rudder travel. Say again. Repeat last. Starting two. Oh, that's not what we said. Alright, what's the first thing on this checklist? It is, uh... No, don't do... Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, that second one went down, it's coming back up. Oh, my god. Why would you do... Th why? That was not the last thing we said at all. It's external power APU. Off. After start checklist. Stand by. You gotta be very careful what you say in front of this guy, because he will he will do almost anything. He will try to start the engine during taxi if you say the wrong phrase. You gotta be very careful what you say on this guy here. Okay, this guy, we need to reset this because this is partly my fault, because I said it, and I made it restart one engine. Kind of idiotic, but anyways, here we are. Now he's redoing all of his after-start checks again, because it's 
part of a script. Generally, FS2 crew is pretty resilient against little errors, but some, but because he heard me tell him to start the engine, which I don't think I actually said, but he thought I did, he went back to that point in the checklist. External power, APU. Off. Main bus tie. Off. Ice protection. Checked level one. Checked level one. Rudder travel. Checked. Full travel. Full travel. Rudder actuator test. Complete. Nose wheel steering. On. Auto feather. Auto feather select. Engine rating. Reduced takeoff power 83%. Checked. 83% checked. Our top, 83% checked. Oh, what the heck is the freezing ones? Hold on. Oh my god. That's what I get for doing something a little outside the box. What is the correct rate response for reduced? Oh my god. Percent set checked. 83% set. Checked. Batteries. Checked. Flaps. 15 set and indicating. 15 set and indicating. Ox, standby, P2 pumps. On. On. Hydraulic pressure quantity. Uh, checked. 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 Hydraulic number 3 in elevator. Checked. Caution warning lights. Checked. Flight instruments radios. Checked. Checked. Altimeters. Three zero two seven set cross check. Three zero two seven set and cross checked. Ice protection test. Complete. After start checklist complete. It's a bit of a lie. Clear on the left. Clear on the right. Alright, it's a Set taxi light to on. Set taxi light to on. Taxi light set to on. Alright, so we'll do a quick little life protection test here. While I get that turned on that. I'm not going to time it. I should be timing it. I would get the FO to time it. What we're going to do is we're just going to make sure it does run its cycles there. And we'll carry on after that. Alright, so the windshields are slowly defogging. I'm going to adjust my seat here for taxiing. That's slow, buddy. Alright, we did get all the segments to come on, I hope, there. If you had an FO, you could get him to do most of these things for you, but because you're sort of on your own in, in, in the flight sim world, it's, uh, F this is where FS2 crew is useful, is you can get an FO who does things for you. He won't do everything. He's not the smartest FO in the world. He's a pretty dumb FO, to be honest. He will just do simple commands, uh, th simple things that you command him to do. He'll do his SOP flows very well. He won't add a constructive, um, you know, constructive effort to the process here, but he will do the basics. He will do some basic commands, he will move some switches and dials and things for you while you're, uh, while you're otherwise preoccupied. Flight deck? Okay, thanks. Captain, they're securing the cabin. Thank you. but he does do some useful things for you. He won't add critical thoughts, he won't help you make a decision in a bind, but he'll definitely do some basic stuff for you to help. Just free your mind up a little bit more for the more uh, challenging mental tasks, as it were, for actually flying. You can actually do the flying while he handles uh, some of the basic system stuff.
little longer to get off the ground than I expected here. I would have thought we'd be almost done off the ground by now. Not much ATC, not much activity still. Daytime on Bad Sim. It's busier than it used to be, but I think after Cross the Pond, now everyone's having a little, <laughs> a little break. It doesn't seem like it's as busy as it was. One runway here, and then a couple taxiways down will be on taxiway uniform, where we'll do our intersection departure. Could have done a single engine taxi up today. Didn't even think about it, to be honest. I showed you guys once, and that's all I showed you guys. It really is hard with FS2 crew. It's FS2 crew is not designed for it. It doesn't work with FS2 crew well. And they don't play nicely together, because FS2 crew expects things to happen in a certain way. You basically got to do single engine taxi by yourself. It's a pity. I think it would be brilliant if FS2 crew was designed to, to accommodate single engine taxi. Okay, crossing runway 1129, clear on the left, and clear on the right. Strobes on for the runway crossing. Okay, don't slow down for the runway crossing, keep going. Keep going. You really rely a lot on your on, on force feedback when you're flying an airplane too. As much as you look at the gauges, it, as much you feel it. You feel accelerations and decelerations. It much, usually, but generally, you'll feel them before you'll ever see them indicate on the instruments. Okay, here's Charlie 2, so I believe the next right turn will be uniform. Clear the runway. Back to strobe red, or anti collision light red, whatever it's called. Takeoff checklist to the line. Flight attendants, please be seated for departure. Notification received. Takeoff briefing complete. Cabin PA complete. Condition levers. Max. Max. Trims. Three set. Three set. Takeoff warning test. Tested. Flight controls check free. Flight taxi. Flight. Radar terrain. Transponder TCAS on ALT. Before takeoff checklist complete to the line. Thank you. Calgary traffic on core 3368 is uh, taking position runway 35 left intersection uniform for departure uh, eastbound towards Saskatoon. Alright, so we'll clear on the left and right.
Select heading mode. Heading selected. Acceleration altitude. Flap zero, IAS 200, climb checklist to the line. Checklist completed to the line. Autopilot on. Autopilot's on. Thousand to go. Alt cell. Checked. Set flight level one nine zero. Set flight level one nine zero. All right, we're, we're uh, airborne. We're on our way. Flight level one hundred zero set alt cell. And uh, we're going to go direct to our first fix here, which is Bet B. We're through sixty five hundred now. And select nav mode. Nav selected. There we go. L nav. We got speed two hundred. He's still setting the one nine or zero. Should set full cell. Flight level one nine zero set. All right, I wasn't sure if he was going to do that or not, but he he didn't, so I did. So the alt cell is in there. Always, always, always make sure that alt cell is set there, or you will not capture the indicated altitude. And that's it. We're on our way to Saskatoon. Look at a beautiful green day on the prairies. I think it's zero degrees outside here in Calgary, but somehow everything is blooming. <laughs> Ironically, I think they've had a bit of a chilly spring out in uh, out in the prairies, whereas. Uh, uh, I'm from Ontario, and uh, here in Ontario, we've had a relatively warm spring. It's not really getting much warmer. Uh, now it's kind of more seasonal than anything, but it started being about started out being above seasonal. It just sort of stayed hovering around the same temperature for most of the last several weeks. There we go. We're on our way. Goodbye, Calgary, one last time, and uh, on our way to uh, to Saskatoon. And this should not take long to get there. Uh, what do we got here? Check our progress page down here. Uh, performance page there. It's saying one hour and 24 minutes. That is at the current climb speed. Where we're grounding, uh, we're grounding 252 with about 20 knots of wind behind us. Hopefully we'll pick up a nice big tailwind and uh, we'll uh, get there a lot faster than an hour and 20. I think we're gonna be closer to an hour en route. Just waiting to get to about, a thousand, to about 10,000 feet above the field before we do our uh, 10 ups climb because that's always supposed to be 10,000 feet AGL. That way it's roughly the same distance above the airport all at all different airports. i got to also sync my condition levers here to 900. There we go. Just going to scrape by this cloud. I think we're going to fly through that next cloud there. Let's zoom this out a little bit so we can zoom, see a little better what's going on. There's our next fix of FETB. Set to Raybox. And we're on our way. All right, on our way, doing well here, and almost to that 10,000 feet above the field. I don't know if anybody noticed that, but I noticed it. The climb performance was noticeably less today with the reduced 83% power that we used for takeoff. I almost always used normal takeoff power and top. Today we decided to use the reduced 83, and it made a noticeable difference. Um, I didn't notice it so much on the runway. The airplane still accelerated to a reasonable rate, but one thing I noticed was that after we pitched up after takeoff, uh, the airplane did not have as much surplus power to climb. I, I settled into about a 10 degree nose up attitude and that was all I could do and it held just above the uh, flap retraction speed. It didn't want to accelerate too much at that reduced uh, 83%. Now we're up to 88% uh, climb power here, so we're actually doing a little better here at climb, but I noticed that. Didn't notice it on the runway so much. 
Uh, but I did notice that as soon as we were airborne, that the airplane did not have the normal get up and go. So it's definitely a noticeable reduction with that reduced 83%. Let's go ahead and make sure that the prop heat is on and the windshield heat is on. Yes, we got uh, level two, and that also includes a 24 hours ice test as well. All right, there we go. Below the line. Below the line. There it goes. Lights off. Climb checklist complete. Thank you. And we're going to get the seatbelts off. And we're going to check the pressurization. Uh, the captain's definitely climbing at a controlled rate. The differential's getting close to max, but it's not uh, exceeding any limits. And we're on our way to Saskatoon. What nice uh, prairies we have out there. Thank you, Orbex, for bringing us such nice scenery. Uh, somebody asked me in the uh, last uh, stream, or anyways, commented in my last video, if I use any uh, custom shaders, and I do not. Uh, this is default uh, shaders provided with P3D here. I have not, ever, I've never installed any custom shaders. I've never really seen the need. I think the colors are reasonably realistic in most cases. Uh, the default scenery, it is a little bit bland, per se, but the... Um, when you start throwing something like some Orbex textures down, and these are Orbex textures down here, those really help uh, make it look a lot nicer. So uh, I think that's what really made what really makes it. It's not the not necessarily having uh, coloring, providing coloring to the textures that are already there, but replacing the textures that are in the sim built into the sim with much better, higher quality textures. And even as you look out there now, I've got uh, I've got the Triple Crown from Orbex. I've got the FTX Global, the Global Vector, and uh, Open Land class for North America at this point. And one thing I notice as I look around is I find it quite hard, I, I, I do see it in a few places, but I find it a lot harder than ever before to notice the repeating patterns. I do see a few of them here and there now that I'm starting to look a little bit more carefully, but certainly at a glance, there is enough texture and enough variety of the texture that you don't notice the repeating patterns. I don't know if anybody else notices that, but I definitely notice that. I don't I don't see the repeating patterns like, uh, like I used to. Before I had uh, even open land class made a big difference. I don't know if there's more texture in it, or if they just simply have uh, arranged the textures better with uh, with better land class definitions. I imagine there must be more textures because it seems like as soon as we did open land class, it seemed like the repetition disappeared. Thousand to go. Alt cell. Checked. And. Two nine nine two set cross check. No. Oh. 2992 set cross check. 2992. Alright, so he's transitioned as well. And that's it. We're climbing up to 190 for our cruise over to Saskatoon today. It's a pretty quick little flight here. So uh, we won't have much time to chat in flight, but there is something I want to talk about, which probably everyone wants to talk about right now. And amazingly, it doesn't involve COVID, so hooray! Something to talk about that's not COVID related. <laughs> Altstar. You can see some differences out there in the train in the distance. You can see some built up areas. Uh, you know, the prairies do go on for a long time with some fairly repetitive landscapes. I'm not being critical, it's just the way it is. It's just endless fields. But you can do it. And as we do this now, we're down to an hour and nine, and we're still accelerating. We got a lot of accelerating to do here. We're going to tack on at least another 50 or 60 knots to the speed here, so we're going to take that well below an hour there. Alt. So there we are. So, uh, what's new in the flight sim world? Well, yesterday, for anyone who was living under a rock and didn't get it uh, immediately emailed to them by their friends, uh, yesterday, Lockheed Martin made an announcement, and that is that version 5 of uh, prepared is coming to uh, is coming out is launching in one week's time. This is one thing that I find sometimes odd about the sim world, uh, and when you compare it to quote unquote normal gaming worlds, is that the sim world uh, there tends to be very little lead up to announcements. Uh, they don't spend a lot of time on marketing campaigns, uh, a lot of money on marketing campaigns either. Uh, it's all of a sudden here it is, you know. Oh, uh, you know, we're working on it, we're working on it, and then all of a sudden, guess what? Next week you're going to have a new sim, and that's it, you know. And and the funny thing is that they don't need to market because it's a it, it's such a dedicated group of simmers, 
um, with a few dedicated news channels, but the people who are very into this, they're very into this. They don't let a lot of news pass them by very easily. They, they check the news channels on a regular basis, um, you know, through subscriptions or just visiting sites, you know, at least a couple of times a week, I would imagine most. Any, anyone who's a real hardcore simmer visits a couple times a week to see what's new in the world. So they don't need to advertise much because the simmers come out to find the news very easily. All they need to do is send it out to a couple of specific platforms, uh, a couple of popular news platforms, and everybody will find it out in a very short period of time. So uh, they don't need to do a lot of advertising. The, the, the products sell themselves, I think, in a lot of cases through the videos that they uh, through the videos, the trailers that they put out there, and just the knowledge of the product. Um, these things sell themselves. <laughs> In general, I would say simmers are fairly knowledgeable consumers in that they, they don't go out on a whim and buy things uh, spontaneously too often. They definitely look, and they know what to look for. They know what technical details to look for, what specifications to look for. People who are new to the sim world, they won't necessarily know that, and they'll need some help and guidance along the way. But most experienced simmers know what they're looking for in a sim. They know, you know, uh, chances are probably more than half the people who read the, the news release then read the release notes. Uh, of all the updates and decided whether it was personally whether it was the new sim was worth it for them or not. Uh, and so, of course, uh, the question uh, would be, do I think it's worth it for me or not? And I think the answer is right off the bat, no. Uh, hands down, no. And it, it's just because I'm pretty happy with P3D version 4. Now that we've moved into the 64-bit world, you know, six, P3D version 4 was a revolution because it was 64 bits. And that, that was huge. It allowed... Uh, it allowed developers to put so much more into the sim, we stopped having out-of-memory errors as being a common thing that happened for most people. Um, we were able to take full advantage of modern computing power. I feel like version 5 is not going to be that big of a transition. Version 5 is still going to be, there's going to be improvements. There's some really neat stuff in there. and There's stuff that does excite me. Um, a better default weather engine, but again, uh, you know, um, but I've already got a weather engine that works for me in this, in version 4. Um, the thing that excites me the most, I think, is, as silly as it is, is the sloped runways. Um, it's a silly thing, but it's important. Uh, it really adds a lot of atmosphere. There's a lot of airports out there where the sloped runways uh, and sloped taxiways are uh, yeah, contribute huge to the feel of the airport. Atlanta is one that comes to mind right away. Denver's another one. Um, where, uh, where the developers that have created these sceneries have done a great job with them, but without the sloped runways, they lack a lot of the realism you get from real life. Certain airports are flat as a pancake, and there's not much you need to worry about with sloped runways. Um, but even even the ones that are flat as a pancake, I think of Dallas-Fort Worth comes to mind. Even it's not flat as a pancake because it's got the bridges, and the bridges in, in the... In the P3D version 4 world are just flat, but if you can add a third dimension to those bridges, you go up the hill and back down the other side, wow, what a difference that's going to be. So that's something that to me is, it's it's a big improvement that's been a long time in coming. It's one of the biggest notable uh, glaring oversights of the P3D platform. The other thing, of course, is um, support for DX12, which is going to um, hopefully give them the capability to make much better use of all of your computing power. We all know that uh, P3D is CPU intensive and not GPU intensive and that, that just draws on FSX days when the CPU was the much more powerful processor in your computer. If you had a GPU it was generally pretty wimpy. Um, obviously in the last 10 years that has shifted gigant, uh, major shift uh, in that uh, difference now. Now generally people's GPUs are probably almost more powerful than their CPUs. So switching to DX12 hopefully will give um, Lockheed Martin more of an ability to make the most of both of your processors, or however many processors, however many cores, and whatever else you've got going on, hopefully it'll help. It'll help make the system, uh, the software, smarter and more able to distribute the load appropriately to all the different uh, processing units and give you the best performance that your rig, whatever your rig can be, will, will give you. So that's big. I mean, that is big. I won't say it's big, but it's not going to be the revolution I think that version four was, just because 64 bits just changed the game altogether. It may it took us from okay, we couldn't even deal with the memory problems we had to guess what, you can run a PMDG aircraft alongside a high quality scenery um, with FTX Global installed, and guess what, your sim doesn't crash. And it's as silly as that was, it was it was crucial. People were running PMDG airplanes and they were running it with basic default scenery because that was the only way they could run the PMDG airplanes. You had this beautiful airplane and terrible scenery, or beautiful scenery flying default airplanes because that was all that you could handle. So, I, I, version five, I, I don't see it as being a revolution. I see it as being a great iteration in the, in the line. Am I going to leap out the gate and buy it? Absolutely not. Um, I'm happy with the sim the way it runs right now. I've got it running pretty well. I'm pulling in 60 frames a second, mind you. It's pretty boring out here on the prairies. Uh, no offense to anyone who lives here. But there's not a whole lot of detailed scenery here. 
but uh, it's not something. It's something I'm going to sit back and I'm going to watch and wait for. I should probably be doing this cruise check too, just quickly here. Get those. There we are. Let's see here. Um, it's not something I'm going to dismiss outright. I will at some point probably upgrade to that sim. I will consider it for a while, but it's not one that I'm going to leap out there and buy it at first glance. Uh, it's going to be something I'm going to have to wait. I'm going to have to make sure that the products that I enjoy are supported because I have a sim that works just fine. Yeah, I've gotten used to its shortcomings. I can overcome them. Uh, you know, you can. The default weather is pretty, meh, pretty unreasonable. It's pretty lousy, but you can. Um, but you can install Active Sky, Active Sky Cloud Art, or you know, Rex, uh, you know. Uh, Whatever, whatever you want to enhance your sim, developers have come along and, and, and filled in the gaps and, and made the sims run better. So there's not an immediate need for that sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I see it being um, something that's going to be useful in the future, and I may consider upgrading to it once a lot of my software is supported. It looks like right out the bat, right off the bat, uh, all the developers are saying right now it looks like the conversion of airports, for those that had the inside track and even those that didn't and have talked to the other developers, it looks like the conversion, especially of airports, is going to be pretty straightforward. The airports are going to be better, they're going to have default PBR textures and all sorts of good stuff like that, but the basic airports are going to be more or less, uh, they're going to be fairly simple upgrades for the payware airports. So most of the developers right now are saying that yes, we will support uh, version 5, uh, at no additional cost, we'll provide an upgraded version at no additional cost, which is good. And, and I'm happy to see that, that the developers are just like, we'd like to see you continue to use the airports we've, we've designed. Um, you know, even if it's a minimal upgrade charge, you know, you're talking in the $5 range. Okay, in most cases, depending on how old the old software is and how much work goes into it. I know it, it's not instant. It does take some effort. Um, the question is, how much effort does it really take you in? If you go and you look at it and say, okay, well, since this is a new version, we're going to try and do some upgrades around the edges, okay, then you've justified the cost of, you know, maybe we're updating the taxiway layout or the terminal buildings have been have been renovated. You know, okay, then you're absolutely justifying the cost of a, of a new of a new software product then. But if you're just running it through a pretty quick conversion, and by the sounds of it, most developers have said, it's a pretty quick conversion. It's not going to take a lot to get you into the new sim, uh, to, get, to get scenery into the new sim, then the, most of them are not going to charge for an upgrade, which is great. Airplanes have always been a little bit more complicated because they they have a lot more going on. Um, they're not just static objects, but they have things that interact with the sim a lot more constantly. Um, you know, whether it be through weather and speed and, and air temperature and whatever else. Uh, there's a lot more interaction between an airplane and the simulator than a scenery. So uh, airplanes, I would not necessarily expect free upgrades. Um, but it sounds like a lot of airplanes that do not make, uh, that do not try to trick the sim too much will have a crazy amount, a crazy issue with upgrading. Um, Aerosoft specifically said it sounds like their A320 and 330 families will probably work with the sim pretty much as is or were with minimal upgrade and at no cost uh, to uh, the existing customers. So it sounds like certain sims, certain uh, products is not going to be a problem. PMDG has been silent so far. Uh, we'll see what they say if they're going to support version 5 at all. I hope they do because I really like the PMDG products. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to fall into the Microsoft 2020 platform. But that's a whole another debate right there. So the question is now, which platform do you want? Because I think a lot of people sort of saw themselves transitioning out of P3D and into Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. But now here we have a new platform that's going to be available in a week, whereas 2020 doesn't even have a target release date. It doesn't even have a target release month yet. We just know it's coming out sometime soon. The developers are working through it. They're obviously doing stuff. Things are happening, but there's no set time frame for the release of that. So are the current prepared users, are they going to continue on the prepared platform? Are they going to upgrade to version 5? Chances are it's going to be the same as same cost as every previous version. It's probably going to be, you know, uh, $200 for the professional version, $70 for the academic version. Who's going to who's going to pay up that money? <laughs> and I'm not trying to be rude, or you know, um, I'm not trying to. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying that in, in a kind of a, a rhetorical or facetious pattern, but just I, I'm curious just to see how many people now. You know, I think a lot of people were really kind of drooling over uh, Flight Sim 2020, and I think with good cause. I think it's going to be a great sim as well, but. Uh, this really throws a bit of a wrench into that equation now, and this sort of, I won't say this came out of nowhere, people knew it was happening behind the scenes, but no one knew the targeted release date until yesterday, and all of a sudden, boom, guess what, you got a new sim in a week, um, which is going to be months and months ahead of uh, 
Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to upgrade your prepared sim and just continue on the prepared platform? Are you just going to hold off on that uh, and see what the Microsoft 2020 platform looks like? Which developers are going to support which platforms? Which products are going to be on which platforms? So many questions. Way more questions than answers at this point. Uh, I think anyone who's really kind of smart at this point is really going to play the wait and see game. Uh, that's what I see myself doing right now. Unless I see some sudden overriding need to upgrade to the to P3D version 5, I don't see it happening anytime soon. What I see happening is, for myself anyways, and I think a lot of people are probably going to sit in this boat, a lot of us are going to sit on the fence and say, let's wait till Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 comes out. Let's see what it has to offer. Let's be able to offer a side-by-side -side comparison. Because right now, we got a lot of great videos of, of, of the development process, but these are a lot of tech alphas. These are not necessarily, uh, you know, these aren't even beta versions, let alone full versions. So how much of what is in there right now is going to make it into the final version? What's the performance going to be like when you get tweaked and get into the final versions of uh, Flight Sim 2020? So I think a lot of people are going to sit on the fence on this one and say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to see what... Flight Sim 2020 is going to bring us. I want to see what it's going to bring us, and is it going to be, uh, is it going to be something worthwhile? Is it going to offer something worthwhile that P3D is not offering us? Is P3D going to offer something worthwhile that uh, Flight Sim 2020 is not going to offer us? I think there's going to be a lot of similarities, but there's going to be a lot of differences. It's a great thing to have three platforms, but it's a terrible thing to have three platforms, of course, including the X-Plane platform as well, um, because. It's great to have competition to a degree. It absolutely is because then, of course, every developer is, uh, you know, the developers of the platforms are doing their best to put their best platform forward to compete for for your dollar to, to contribute to their platform, to compete to have you operating on their platform. The flip side of it, however, is that then the add-on developers have then got to decide what platforms they want to support. Do they want to put the effort into supporting all three platforms? Do they want to focus their effort on one or maybe two of the three platforms? You know, and forego the customers who are on the other platforms. What about portability? If I decide to switch platforms, I'm on P3D version 4 right now. What if I decide to switch to Flight Sim 2020? How many of my add-ons are portable to that? You know, obviously, if I switch to X-Plane, it's a completely different animal. The funny thing is that Prepared and Flight Sim, of course, have a common ancestry, so there will be some expected compatibility between them, and hopefully things will be a little bit more easily convertible between the two, but I feel like this is going to be the point where we start to see them diverge more, and P3D really becomes a product that lives on its own, uh, not just as a as a child of Flight Simulator, but as its own product, whereas Flight Simulator, I think, will be something that uh, I think will carry on the tradition of an, an, an entertainment product more. But it's going to be interesting uh, to see what the advantages are of both are, what are the differences in both worlds. It, there's a lot of, there's just a lot of unanswered questions at this point. Lots of unanswered questions, and we have to get through those unanswered questions and, uh, and see what these different platforms have to offer. I'm excited about it. I really am. I can't wait to see what comes out of these uh, platforms here. Uh, I think they're, I think they both have a lot of merit. I think they really do. Um, and I don't and I'm not going to commit myself to one either way at this point. There's not enough information out there. I'm going to let other people like, go out there, spend their money, uh, you know, make videos, write reviews, take, take their, going to read a lot of takes on the different products before I make any kind of decision for myself about changing. I'm going to let other people be the guinea pigs. I'm happy. I'm contented with the way this network, uh, network this software works right now. You know, it's a, it's a pretty nice piece of software. It uh, it looks pretty good. The airplanes, the developer add-ons look pretty good. I've got the scenery looking pretty good at this point. I've got it looking the way I really like it at this point. Um, the clouds sometimes still are a little bit simplistic, even with Active Sky. Uh, the nice thing about Active Sky is just the varieties you sail around. You've got cirrus clouds mixed with cumulus clouds. Um, there is wispiness to them, so I do like them. But as I've sat here and looked at them more and more, even then I start to say, I can see the computer generation in them, I'm not, it's not that I'm unhappy with them, it's that I can see the repetition in them, I can, I've seen them so much now, I, I, and I, I feel like they could be better. Will the d default weather in version 5 of Prepared be better than this? Maybe it will. Maybe that will make it worthwhile. I'm going to let other people go out there, make videos, show off what the sim can really, truly do. The other thing, of course, is going to be what are the specs... Uh, what are the minimum required performance specs to get decent performance out of the sim? Is it going to be more tuned than the existing sim? That might be something that might make it worthwhile. But I'm going to let other people go out on that limb. I'm going to sit back, enjoy the sim I've got, 
because I really do like the sim I've got. I think it works nicely now. And then in the future, I'll reserve my judgments. I'm not to say I won't convert to another sim platform at some point. I probably will. Whether it's going to be the Flight Sim 2020 platform, prepared version 5, that has yet to be decided because there's just not enough information. Alright guys, give me uh, five minutes to just refresh my cup of coffee and I will be right back with you and then we'll uh, start setting up for this rival into Saskatoon. Stand by. Alright, well, as you can tell, I'm back. <laughs> as I unpaused my track IR, boy, she just went a little nutty there. Let's see if we can reset that there. A little better. There we go. Definitely looking green. It's kind of nice to be flying around in spring. I, I tell you this, I've gotten a little bit tired of the winter scenery. <laughs> flying around back and forth to all these airports in, uh, in on the prairies and in the mountains uh, in uh, western Canada here. And just tired of seeing snow all the time. So it's kind of nice that we've passed off into April and that the, everything's turning green out there. It's really nice to see. I like it a lot. I hope you guys, uh, hope you guys are enjoying it as well. It's nice. It's, it's, it's just, it's different from the rest of the sim. I don't know that things quite look this green out here yet. There tends to be a real brown season. Between winter and, and really green spring, there tends to be a very brown season in, uh, when you're looking out of the window of an airplane where the snow is melted, but nothing's really budding yet. So you just see just trees, branches, you know, that sort of thing. So. You tend to tend to have a very brown season in between, but you don't see that in most of flight simulators. They tend to go right from hey, it's winter to hey, look, everything's green again. Which I mind you, the brown is pretty unattractive to look at. <laughs> but uh, and that's that's what you tend to notice. That's, that's, what, that's what tends to be realistic, anyways. But uh, it's nice to see some green weather out here again. I'm happy that spring is here. Nice that we can spend some time outside. I don't know why I'm sitting here screaming to you guys, but <laughs> I could be spending time outside. <laughs> oh, after this, I will go outside for sure. I believe we're just about to cross into Winnipeg airspace, and they were offline, and then they came back online again. So we're going to go ahead and give them a little shout here. If you guys, uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and pull tune them up. It looks like we're about to cross that boundary in the next uh, couple minutes here. So let's go ahead and do this. 24, nothing. Winnipeg Center, very good afternoon. It's uh, Encore 3368, level 190. Encore 3368, Winnipeg, Squawk 0623. 0623 for Encore 3368. in the box. How are we doing now? Uh, now we're, we're about... Level one, nine or zero. Do you have a preference on runway for Saskatoon? The wind's right now, 330 at 15, that's 27. Uh, Encore 33, uh, 68, uh, we'll get back to you, standby. So yeah, it's a pretty strong gusty... 
Hey, Roger. Pretty gusty wind there in uh, Saskatoon today. It's going for an interesting landing. So let's see what we got here for runways. If I remember right, we do probably have a runway that goes more or less into the wind here. Uh, oh, that's Calgary. Wrong airport. Uh, let's kill that. That's what we're looking for. Saskatoon. All right, we're doing the Maybob arrival. We can pin that. And let's have a look here. See, we can do 33. 6,200 feet, we can totally land this Dash 8 on 6,200 feet. So let's do that. Let's do 33. And uh, I believe there's an ILS to 33. Nope, just an RNAV as well. Okay, so we'll take that RNAV to 33. Let's kill just a couple of the extra things we don't need down here anymore. Calgary. All right. Yeah, let's do that. Winnipeg Center, Encore 3368. I'd like to plan the uh, RNAV Zulu runway 33 in Saskatoon, please. Encore 3368, notice uh, that'll be the Navy Office arrival for the RNAV Zulu runway 33. Okay, uh, we've got the uh, RNAV uh, Zulu uh, for runway, we'll plan on the RNAV Zulu for runway 33 by the Navy Office 6 arrival, uh, Encore 3368. You guys think that ATC is really quiet. It looks like it's having a hard time topping out over my, the sound of the airplane here. I'm going to turn the airplane down a little wee bit. I'm going to turn up the uh, ATC just a little higher. And Winnipeg Center, Encore 3368. Can I just get a radio check from you, please? Encore 3368, Thank you. I feel like you guys are not hearing that at all. I don't know why. It should be. Output device is the correct output device. But I feel like it's not coming in any at loud enough through speakers. Let me check my other volume levels here. Wait a second here. Where is... No, be pilot. Yeah, no, it should be. I don't understand why. Uh, Hopefully you guys can hear that okay. I just felt like it was a little quiet. All right, so uh, since we've talked about the arrival with our Winnipeg controller, let's go ahead and set that up. So, our discretion to uh, 10,000 on 3002 Encore 3368. Thank you. All right, so. Nice to see your nice to see you and hear your friendly voice again. Nope, don't set it there. You gotta leave that standard. It's this one. You gotta set three zero zero two. Okay, um so let's just check that arrival for altitude restrictions and then we can plan our descent. Uh so Erlon at or above six thousand. I guess we gotta first of all we gotta reprogram this FMS here, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to bring up my FMS here. There you go. All right. So, flight plan menu arrive. We don't want to do 27. We want to do 33. Number four. Still going to be the Maybob 6 arrival. Uh, runway 33 transition. And via an Arnav Zulu runway 33. Number three. Uh, it looks like Erlon is the transition. All right, so we got Emota, Mavop's the next fix, Mavop, Erlon at or above 6, S-Fox at or above 4,000, and then it repeats itself. So let's go ahead and bring that up so it doesn't repeat itself. Number 15. There we go, and uh, let's just have a quick look at this chart here, and let's figure this out. Uh, 6,000 and 4,000, let's compare it to the approach here. Uh, the recommended 4,000 at S Fox. So let's do that. Let's do, yeah, let's put these in 6,000 and 4,000. So I'm going to just harden these up as cross at 6,000. I don't think I can do it that way. Silly. All right, so VNAV to Erlon. I can, it'll harden it up here. There we go. 2.83, eight minutes till we start down. Perfect. Okay, so we got a little bit of time to finish this, figure this out. So First of all, let's get some speeds in there. Uh, so we go to our performance page as always, 
and uh, sh shows us landing in Saskatoon at about 60,700, so we'll round that up to 61,000 because we'll burn less fuel once we bring the power back for the descent. So, uh, it's just relatively short runway. It's not really that short. Um, we'll do flap 15 because we got a good strong headwind and that will help uh, with control. When you have full flaps in the Dash 8, it, it tend, the winds tend to grab the airplane even more and rock it around a little bit more, so you tend to like to use less flaps during a high wind situation. So let's plan that. Let's plan a... Uh, let's plan a flap 15 landing in Saskatoon today at 61,000 pounds. Our VRAF is going to be 125. And our VGO is going to be 115. Uh, and then our fry and climb are going to be 29 and 52. No, don't press that. Okay. Press it once lightly. There we go. So we put it in the back here. And that way we have the numbers handy. Just in case. 30 and 52. Alright. Uh, there we go. So the speeds are in. Uh, let's go ahead and make sure we got everything else we need here. So we got the arrivals on the alt, or the altitudes on the arrival. Max to 10 knots, max 190 knots, and that talty is only this way here. Okay, good. All right, so, so let's just look at the approach here. Uh, we don't need any frequencies or anything. Uh, we would do a range check to make sure that we will have sufficient GPS coverage when we get there. We'll say that's done, and uh, we'll just have to put in our LNAV, VNAV, MDA here because we don't have an LPV cable system of 1948, so we round that to 1950. Now we're going to wind this all the way down from the Calgary altitude, then when I go back to Calgary, we're going to wind this all the way back up again. 1950 is what we're looking for for the MDA here for the minimums. 1950. La la la. Winding it down. Almost there. There we go. 1950. Uh, and then the, the elevation of the airport itself is at uh, 1654, so let's go ahead and set that landing altitude as well. That's a thousand there, that's fifteen, that's about sixteen hundred and something there. So there we go. That's within reason. And I think we're just about ready for a briefing. Are you ready for the approach briefing? Go ahead. Okay, so again, pull this up. We are doing I'm gonna pause that track IR. We're doing the Mavob six arrival into Saskatoon today on page ten two Charlie and effective on the thirtieth of January of this year. Changes Mavod five remembered Mavod six waypot. Waypoint Erpot renamed to S Fox. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm unfamiliar with it anyway, so it's all new to me. <laughs> That's why you check the charts for when your things change when, with what you're familiar with, but this is all new to me. So uh, we're going to hit up Mavob. After that, we're going to go straight to Erlon at or above 6,000 and a max 210 knots, and then S Fox at a max 190 knots at or above 4,000. And that's where uh, basically at Erlon we're transitioning to the approach descent planning plan, the RNF GNSS runway 27 crossing. Talty at or above 6200. Actual descent clearance is as issued by ATC. That's fine. Uh, and then, so next we have the RNAV Zulu. It's a pretty straightforward little approach here. 12 4, the RNAV Zulu, the runway 33 here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. 30th of January 2020. Again, the waypoint was replaced. The same note because it's the same waypoint on this uh, approach as well. So uh, we don't have WASH channels in this aircraft. Final approach course 330. It should be here in the FMS. It is, as you can see here, course 330, 329. Within one or two degrees is acceptable. Uh, sometimes it's just simply calculation and rounding errors. Looks like we're picking up some ice. Really? Select airframe mode to fast. Select airframe mode to fast. Set airframe mode to fast. Airframe mode set to fast. Set reference speeds to increase. Ref speed switch set to increase. There. FO did the job for me. All right. Uh, the Taman crossing height 3,100 feet. Uh, there it is. And the LNAV, uh, BNAV MDA, as we said, is uh, 1948. We got 1950 set. Uh, airport elevation at 1650. The MSA, all sectors around uh, runway 33, is 3,700 feet. The missed approach straight ahead, 5,000 feet. Track 330 to the Kezga intersection up ahead as required shuttle climb to, to, to get up to 5,000. Safe altitude for 100 miles is 45. The MSA is 37. And front compensated Barrow VNAV systems, not authorized below minus 27. Uh, it's not that cold today. It is, uh, I don't know what it is here in Saskatoon, but it ain't that cold. <laughs> it's minus 2. 
Gusty wins, but minus two. Uh, again, the same fix as Erlon ma uh, at 6,000, max 210 knots. As Fox, 4,000, max 190 knots. Then we go to Taman, Ikmer, and then we should be on runway 33, and that's it. Uh, terrain, again, around this airport is uh, 20... What did I say? 3,700? Uh, 3,700. Weather is on and off snow showers, very gusty wind down the runway pretty much here, so uh, not much of a crosswind component. It should help reduce our uh, landing uh, distance, but we will need to add a little bit of uh, extra speed above uh, ref to c compensate for the gusts. I see the top descent alert in the top of my FMS there. We can arm the VNAV now. We've already got the lower altitude set at 10,000 feet, and the VNAV profile is in there. Uh, operational, uh, no TAMs. Do we see any no TAMs in the flight plan here? Have a quick look in the flight plan for anything of interest in... Uh, John D. John G. Diefenbaker International runway certifications 33, good for a quarter mile, good stuff. TACAN and serviceable. Uh, VOR DME 33, TACAN VOR 27, nothing affecting that runway. No broken equipment on this airplane, and last but not least, fuel to go off to um, Regina. Uh, so. Uh, reserves to go to Regina, we've got 2,700, and uh, overhead, Saskatoon right now, we're showing 53, which gives us an excess of another 26, almost 2,700, over an hour of excess fuel. We can definitely do a go-around, come back and try it again, and it won't impact us too much. And that's all I got for now. Any questions? Do you have any questions? No questions. Very good. All right, we're just about ready to start down here. You can see on the MFD here, if I can pop it out why it won't pop out. There it is. You can see the uh, top of drop coming up really quick there. The only other thing I'm going to do really quickly here on my other screen is just quickly look up last time that this airplane uh, or the last time that this flight flew did it have a specific gate in Saskatoon. And apparently last time it arrived at gate 7. Gate number 7 is what we're looking for, guys. So uh, once we get to within the 10,000 feet, 20 and uh, 25 miles, and less than 250 knots, we'll uh, go ahead and set up our arrival gate. And that's pretty much it. There's our arrival. You can see we're just going to pretty much go straight into the approach. It's going to be a nice, straight in, easy arrival. I don't believe there's any other traffic. We've got the ETC online anyways monitoring us, but that's it. We're the only ones inbound to Saskatoon today anyways. As far as scenery goes for Saskatoon, we got some Orbex uh, freeware uh, global, uh, some freeware scenery for Orbex, so it's not the best scenery in the world, it's not the worst scenery in the world. Star 3, so it will be something nicer than just default scenery. Uh, it's not fantastic, it's no FS Dream Team or Fly Tampa, but it's better, no problem. Let me know when you're back. better than default. Alright, any second now, that top intercept's coming in pretty quick here. We're gonna see that, uh, Got vertical guidance bar move off. There it comes. Start getting the power back as soon as you see that moving because she's going to start to pick up speed pretty quick as soon as she pitches down here. There's the VNAV path. And even just as the nose, you see the nose pitching down, bring that power back some more. Especially, we don't have too much of a tail, but it's mostly a crosswind at this point, so it shouldn't add too much to our speed, but you don't want to overspeed it. Alright, and that's it. We're on our descent into Saskatoon already. These flights go pretty quickly in the Dash 8 here. It's going to be a lot longer when we're doing the 3-7 or whatever we choose to do next. I'm going to leave the... Eh, what the heck? We can turn it off, I guess. Set airframe mode to off. Airframe mode set to off. Set reference speeds to off. Ref speed switch set to off. Thank you. Get Buddy to do the work for me. And transition... Uh, set three zero zero two set cross checked. Three zero zero two. And I guess I might as well do descent checklist to the line. Altimeters. Three zero zero two set cross checked. Three zero zero two set and cross checked. Fuel balance. Check. Pressurization. Set. Cabin PA. Uh, standby. I'll be off one. Check. Flight attendants, please prepare the cabin for arrival. Thank you. Cabin PA complete. Fasten belt switch. On. 
Approach and landing brief. Complete. Complete. Descent checklist completed to the line. Set airframe mode to fast. Airframe mode set to fast. Set reference speeds to increase. Ref speed switch set to increase. We had more, uh, more icing showing up there again. What are you going to do? <laughs> Uh, I kind of figured we might get some again on the way down here. It's, uh, what is it down there? It's minus 28 outside. It's pretty chilly. Definitely going to get some uh, ice there. And you can see that we're flying crooked now. That uh, trapezoid's way out because we reduced the power substantially through the descent. So, oh, don't trim too far. That was way too far now. My key is not to let that get stuck. Do it in short bursts. I've always found that it's the best way to trim the dash 8. You just trim it in short bursts. Two maybe three short bursts, see how it sits, and then if it needs more adjustment, do it again a couple times, two or three times. But do it in short little bursts, one, two, maybe one, two, three, and that's it. That's how you trim a dash eight. Don't, you don't generally hold it a long time because that rudder will move pretty quickly. So you just want to trim it a few short bursts here and there. I think we're gonna have a pretty, I think we're gonna spot that field pretty easily as we come in here. I should probably mute this guy because he's listening to everything I'm saying. He's trying to parse it into <laughs> some kind of communication. <laughs> All right. And what was it? 1600 was our field elevation, so at about 11.6 we should be doing our 10,000s. And switching to a more sterile cockpit environment. <laughs> I'm a chatty Cathy in an airplane. Lots to talk about. I'm excited though, we're coming up to the end of the season, this is the second last episode, season old, episode 11, the second last episode of season 2 of Pilot's Life. I'm excited to see what season 3 brings us. Next week we'll probably work, move on to season 3, or at least, very least, we'll definitely try and find the job that will move us into season 3, so stick with me guys, I'm, I'm excited to fly a new airplane, learn something new here. It's been fun flying this Dash, it's a great starter airplane, it's a fantastic starter airliner. Uh, it really does all the things you expect an airliner to do pretty much. The FMS is not as complicated, there's not an auto thrust system, but in terms of being familiar with how to handle, uh, you know, an electronic flight information system, all the various systems, a Dash 8 is a great first airplane for uh, anybody looking to get into the airlines. Uh, it, it's a very... Uh, the systems are generally very well laid out for the most part. Most of the problems with it are just problems of systems not being designed to be strong enough for this airplane, but uh, the air conditioning system being the one that comes to mind. But in terms of flight controls... Okay, we'll plan to cross uh, SVOX at 4000 on core 3368. And uh, descend now, sorry, for crossing SVOX at 4000 on core 3368. The way I read that back was ambiguous, so it's descent clearance now. Descending and crossing SVOX at 4000, which is exactly what we have uh, programmed in here, right? Er, 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 S box of 4,000. That's exactly what we programmed in. And there's 10,000s. See them sim pros for a second there. Below the line. Jukwis landing flap selected 15 degrees. Field transfer via S box. You cleared the RNF Zulu approach from my Via S Fox cleared uh, Saskatoon RNAV Zulu runway 33 Encore 3368. On. On. Speed switch. Bugs. What's the response? Increase set. Increase and set. FA notification complete. Descent checklist complete. Thank you. And uh, we're below 10,000. We should have that speed a lot lower. Let's back off the VNAV for a second here to help us with that. Kind of got preoccupied by three things happening at once. Getting the descent check in there, getting the uh, radio calls in there, and then I missed the 250 knots. and blew right through that speed limit. Alright, so we'll just... Now that we got the speed back, we can increase our descent again, but we just had to react in order to get the speed back. And we should be able to capture that VNAV path again any second. There it is. Yeah, VNAV path. We're back on the path. Good. Alright, we're also a little lower than 250 knots, below 10,000 feet. Saskatoon. There we go. Uh, gate 7 apparently is where we're going, so that's what we got marked. As I was saying, the Dash 8 is a fantastic first airplane for anyone getting into the airline business. Uh, it handles like a big prop airplane. It does. 
Um, for 3368, new altimeter for you, Saskatoon 300. Copy, 30 inches even for Saskatoon, Encore 3368. There we go, 30 inches even. Uh, yeah, it's very for, very forgiving. It handles a lot like a, a smaller airplane. You know, it's, it's heavier. It takes a little more time to react, but it flies the same way. Um, the only trouble with it is learning to land. It's a little bit of a challenge, and only because you've got a, such a... Uh, such a restrictive pitch limitation because of the length of the fuselage. That is probably one of the biggest gotchas when you're first learning how to land, how to fly this airplane, is learning how to land it properly. <laughs> it is a challenge. Beyond that, it's not too bad though. It's not a bad airplane. I've always liked it. Uh, I've, been, I've flew it for five years and I really enjoyed it. It was a really good airplane to fly. So anybody out there looking for a first job in the airline business, a Dash 8, especially a Q400, is a very respectable job. It'll set you up nicely for other future airplanes too. Uh, no, we did do flat 15, what am I thinking? Um, it sets you up very nicely for other future airplanes um, in that it has a fully functional EFIS, electronic flight information system, and all that all that stuff. All right, I should start focusing here on the speeds and everything else. Uh, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off the ice protection here because it looks like we're below the clouds. We're at minus 11, but we're below all the clouds, so I'm not expecting to pick up any more ice. And... Uh, totally forgot what the speed restriction was here. We've blown it, I think. It was 220, 210 knots. 210 knots here. Well, we're to get it back pretty quick. And 190 at the next fix. We're cleared for the approach. So I'm going to go ahead and set 1900 here for the... Uh, for the minimum descent altitude. So it'll continue descending on path. right at idle thrust here because she's having a bit of a hard time slowing down here, honestly. I may need to uh, expedite this descent here. Alright, let's get the high pumps on. First thing that'll help me is flaps 5. Flaps 5. Runway's in sight. Gear down. Gear down. Encore 3368, pass between wind 300, 31, gusting at 37, clear to land, runway 33. Clear to land, runway 33, Encore 3368. Flaps 10. Flaps 10. Flaps 15 before landing checklist. Check the speed. Flaps 15 before landing checklist. Flaps 15, landing gear. Down 3 green. Down 3 green, condition levers. Max. 1000 above, max. Ox, standby, P2 pumps, on. Bleeds, on, mid. FA notification, complete. Flaps. Indicating 15, planned 15. Indicating 15, plan 15. Before landing checklist complete. Checked. Alright. It was a little bit messy trying to do everything at once.
Stable. Landing. Check. One hundred. Eastern Air Three Zero Nine Two. Welcome back. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. That was a bit of a workout. <laughs> Quite the crosswind there. Don't stop. Winnipeg Center on Core 3368, vacating 33 on Alpha, request taxi terminal. Alpha 3368, welcome in pass between Alpha, Bravo to the ramp, good day. Alpha, Bravo to the ramp on Core 3368, thank you, good day. After landing Three checklist. Alpha, whiskey passing 3000, turn right to right four minutes, Alpha. But welcome, guys, to Saskatoon. Wow, that was a little bit of a workout to get that landing in there. Sorry my commentary fell away to zero, but I was really Checklist. pretty focused. Check. Thank you. I was really pretty focused on getting that... Uh, this is Bravo here. Getting that done, so uh, I apologize that the stream went silent there for a little bit, but as you can see, it took a quite a bit of focus. There was more of a crosswind than was being advertised, I think. Uh, so a little bit of effort on my part to get that down, but it, it that was not too bad in the end. A little low in the beginning of the approach there. Started a little high and then I overcompensated and went too low, but at the end of the day we figured it out. We got it done. I don't know where gate 7 is here. I don't have any diagram here that shows me where the gates are, so we're just going to have to drive around the terminal here looking for our marshal area. Chances are if we had a company, you know, route manual, we'd probably be in there, but we don't, so... We don't need to stop, guys. Don't need to stop. Alright, so somewhere here. Uh, I think I see the GSX equipment over here at this gate. So this looks like where we're going. It looks like we have a double control tower, too. It looks like we have FTX Global, and we also have the default scenery poking through by the looks of it. Or are there two towers in Saskatoon? It's possible. There's plenty of airports where there's an old tower that was never torn down. So if anybody knows the truth, you can feel free to tell me. I'll be honest, I don't think I have ever been to Saskatoon. I think this is a first for me. Okay, uh, let's see, where's my marshal? Is that my marshaler there? Are that you my marshaler? I guess this guy's my marshaler here. I assume, are you the marshaler? Yeah, you're the marshaler. Okay. Oh, uh, we were supposed to come in on this line here. Uh, okay, see, I don't know anything about this. Set taxi light to off. Taxi light set to off. moving, buddy. Of course, now I'm not going to be able to see you behind the tug. Worst parking job ever. <laughs> Check that one more time, please, Captain.
Cockpit to ground. Please connect the GPU. Please connect the GPU. Parking checklist to the line. Taxi light. Off. Emergency brake. Park. Nose wheel steering. Captain, the GPU is now connected. Off. Standby PTU pumps. Off. Power levers. Disc. Condition levers. Start feather. Transponder. Uh, standby. Standby. Fasten belt switch. Off. Bleeds. Min off. Parking checklist completed to the line. You're supposed to show me that screen, buddy. No. He didn't connect the GPU. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. Please connect the GPU. Did he disconnect it or something? And then, of course, they open the doors while uh, we're sitting here waiting. Guys, you're not supposed to do that. Okay, there it is. Try it now. Nope. Sometimes you just gotta play with that switch a bunch of times. There it is. Captain, the GPU is now connected. Below the line. External power, APU. Uh, external power is on, APU is off. External power is on, a external power on, APU off. External power is on, APU is off. Condition levers. Fuel off. Lights. Set. Emergency light switch. Off. Standby aux main battery master. Batteries off. Parking checklist complete. Yay, we're here. <laughs> Few glitches here and there. You know, just you know, popping the door open before we ever stop the engine. That's fine. Does this jetway not move here? It doesn't seem to want to move. I don't care. I don't care at this point. We're here. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> Oh, guys. All right. Well, thank you guys for following uh, with me on that one. We're here. We made it to Saskatoon. Let's check it out. And a pilot's life. Boom. One more flight done. One flight left to go. Current flight has now moved up to the return leg of Saskatoon to uh, Calgary, which we're not going to do today. We're going to do another day. But thank you guys so much for flying with me today. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, thank you guys so much for supporting me here on Twitch and on YouTube. If you haven't already, um, subscribe. Follow me on Twitch. Subscribe to me on YouTube. I need a few more subscribers on YouTube, and then uh, we're gonna we're thinking about giving away some prizes. Uh, on the YouTube channel uh, when we reach the uh, next milestone of a thousand subscribers. So if you got any friends out there, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Uh, I appreciate you guys all supporting me. Guys, stay healthy out there, stay safe, and we will see you guys uh, all for the next uh, episode real soon. Take care.